Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. But isn't it wonderful to think that we're here tonight to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the founding of this group? Now, let's take a good look at this situation. Things like this just don't happen. It means that down through the years, there has always been enough people who have had a great concern, and they've placed proper value on the membership they hold in Alcoholics Anonymous, and they know that this is where they get the big gobs of AA that they need, in an AA meeting room. Now, we can go to hospitals, and we can be very active in contacting nursing homes. We can uh, uh, dine in our lunch hours three, four times a week at a particular restaurant where we know we're going to meet a few of the AA boys or girls. And uh, all of those things are important. But there's nothing takes the place of an AA meeting. That's my personal opinion, and it must be the opinion of a lot of people. Because if it wasn't for AA groups, there wouldn't be any AA. I say that because when we go to an AA meeting, we're available. We're available to receive the help that we need from a power greater than ourselves we call God. God never came down and sat in my lap and whispered in my ear and told me what to do. But he sure communicates with me when I go to a meeting because he uses you to communicate with me. And by the same token, if he sees fit, he can use me. And help communicate with someone else. But we can't do this job any better than we do when we're at an AA meeting. In an AA meeting room. Did you ever, I'm not talking to the people of just Brand Bank and New, and some of those have already felt this, but did you ever experience a spirit of willingness and a spirit of, a spirit of oneness like you find in an AA meeting? There are times when well, if we were in church, we'd actually say the Holy Ghost was right there, sitting in our lap. And there's a spirit that prevails, an AA, because of the trouble that we're in when we come to AA. And yes, because we're members of AA, that doesn't mean the end of our trouble. Most people come to Alcoholics Anonymous because they're in trouble. Now, if I'm wrong, I'm going to find out. Anybody who is in this room tonight that admits that he's an alcoholic or she admits that she's an alcoholic and is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and came here who was not in trouble, please raise your hand. Anybody? (laughs) You see what I mean? Now, some of us had wife trouble, some had husband trouble, some had job trouble, some had money trouble, some had cop trouble. Some had workhouse trouble. Like Jimmy Kane says, I, I got spook shows from walking in and out of panty wagon. You know? <laughs> but, but regardless of what kind of trouble we had, some of us had all of those troubles. Some of us only had one of those troubles. But one trouble we all had, we couldn't live with ourselves. And we found that when we used alcoholic beverage, we could be transferred from a world of reality into a world of fictitious value. That's why they have mirrors on back bars. You think that's to reflect those bottles? Nah. Get a couple of shots, you're sitting on a stool, you look at a back bar mirror. Ooh, who do you see? (laughs) There's a distinction. Remember those ads you saw in the paper, you know? Did you ever see the whiskey or the brewery or the winery ad showing a bunch of working men with a lunch bucket under their arm at the corner saloon? Nah, you never will. You know what they do? They appeal to people like me by showing these ads, a man of distinction in a beautiful home or a country club, everything conducive to gracious living. And then when I get a couple of rivets in me, there I am. You can be anything you want to be under the influence of liquor. Your troubles go back. Whiskey makes you frisky. 
You get courage like you never had before. Inhibitions drop. Conscience is dulled. And boy, you're right on top. But the darn stuff wears off. And then you sober up. You don't have to be blind so you can't move a little finger. Just, you know, so you're in a never-never land. And then that wears off. And what happens? You're back to all your troubles and a few more. And those troubles. Why did we drink? Who's an alcoholic? What's an alcoholic? Isn't it wonderful that the doors of AA are so wide open that anybody, anybody, regardless of his creed, race, degree of education, earning capacity, IQ rating, name it, name the variance, we got it. Why is it that this thing is so wide open that all these different types and kinds of people can come in and be successful? First of all, as I understand it, a man or a woman is an alcoholic when they admit, according to their own set of standards, that their life has become unmanageable. It isn't what the psychiatrist says, what the preacher says, what the doctor says, what the wife or the husband says. No, it's the individual himself. When he or she comes to that conclusion, why has it become unmanageable? I understand that about four months ago we had a woman come into AA. Now, she had been drinking, but she, she did, didn't find uh, herself in automobile accidents, and she didn't go to jail, and uh, her credit was good, and uh, she had a pretty decent <coughs> reputation in the community because she was a closed closet drunk. You know, she got drunk at home. Like most women, they don't go out like us guys and perform, make spectacles of themselves. But this woman came in AA. Did I pronounce that right? Or did you think I said something else? This woman came into AA because the night before she forgot to kiss her nine-year-old daughter. Good night. She was too drunk. To her, that was a catastrophe. And she shouldn't be belittled for it. So she came in. And after she came to AA, she found out that there was a few other things happened that she didn't like. <laughs> I came to AA because I, I had a financial problem. And before I went upstairs over Schmatz's Hall on 25th Street, I looked to the left and the right and the rear to see if anybody saw me go upstairs with those drunks. And you could read a newspaper through the seat of my pants. False pride, I had tons of it. Thank goodness there was a group then. But after I got in here, I found out, the very first night, I found out, these guys got my number and I got theirs. Got to start dealing from the top of the deck. And that's the truth. That's one thing about these alcoholics. You can't fool them. They might be the best actors in the world, and they sure are. I'm, I'm including myself in that. But boy, oh boy, if, if you just get out in left field a little bit, you get clobbered. And that's another good thing about it. I heard a speaker yesterday morning say that there is a difference in our quality, the quality of our sobriety. He said there are some people, they, they get drunk, <laughs> who cares? He expected it. Then there's others, if you hear or see or find out that they drank, it's a terrific shock. We didn't expect it. Their quality. Well, now, who are the people that stay sober in AA? Who are they? You got the big book? Oh, good thing they got the big book. You wouldn't believe me. I got to take this out of the book. I got to read this. Many of them have. Listen closely. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. That's gospel. That we know. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunate. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. And the first time I went over that, I thought, oh, why'd they have to put that rigorous in there? 
Ooh. That's a down deep kind. Their chances are less than average. There are those two who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. That means you can make the grade if you're not even wrapped tight. <laughs> See what I mean? The door is wide open. Even screwballs like me. But, you know, there's a lot in that paragraph if we'll only take in consideration the fact that it isn't by men's standards that we stay sober. There's nothing in this book that tells us any more than what we read in this paragraph here and the 12 suggested steps of recovery, what is necessary. And these are only suggestions. But the difference between Alcoholics Anonymous and anything else that I've ever heard of, ever known of, ever been affiliated with, is this. It isn't how many meetings you go to, how many people you sponsor, how many leads you make, how many hospital calls you make. Of course, it's necessary. It's important. We can't, we can't do this job without the 12 steps, any more than we can do this job without any of the other steps. But the difference between AA and anything else I ever known is this. If our motives and our intentions are not proper and honest, we expose ourselves by getting stiff. I was in about four months, and one time I said to Earl Appleby, boy, I don't know how that guy stays sober. He says it's none of your damn business. <laughs> and I never said that again. And it isn't any of my business. It's God's business. He's the one that decides. And according to our standards, sometimes his standards we can't understand. That's what makes a believer of us. We believe the things that are beyond human comprehension. And the most dubious person that ever came to Alcoholics Anonymous, he can't stay in this outfit three weeks, keep an open mind, and remain dubious. Too many nice things happen. And they can't all be classed as coincidental. So even the most dubious begins to believe begins to believe that there is a power greater than self. Begins to believe that, that this prayer business that really pays off. Begins to believe that possibly honesty is the best policy. Some of the things that were given to him before he ever went to grammar school by the parents, by the teachers and the preachers in Sunday school, and so on. These truths come back to us. Why shouldn't they? After all, didn't we try everything? I tried everything. I don't mean just to quit drinking. I tried everything to learn how to live. And eventually this alcoholism, this non-curable disease, turned out to be a blessing in disguise. And I maintain that's why these groups continue to function. Because there are always enough people around to see that there is a place for them to meet to get the ashtrays around, to get the coffee, to arrange for the speakers, to make sure that the group not only confines its activities to the immediate needs of the group, but they go beyond that. They see that they become a working force and a part of our unity, the second tradition, the second legacy of AA. Group unity. The left hand knows what the right hand's doing. They're active in intergroup councils. They participate and they sustain places like our inner group office and go beyond that to the 12-step work at the world level. When God in the Bible said, Go ye and preach to all nations, I believe that he meant for Alcoholics Anonymous to carry this message to every individual that seeks it throughout the world. And our world service in New York do the work for the groups that the groups can't do for themselves. Men of industry, men of education, religion, of government, every segment of society you can think of have made inquiry. They want to know about us. Isn't it wonderful that we have a facility where this message can't be garbled? On the local scene, our intergroup office, on the world scene, 
our headquarters in New York. These things just don't happen, my dear friend. I particularly am indebted to this group. It so happened that a man and woman walking around sober for six months attracted me to AA. The lady happened to be a member of this group. I, why shouldn't I feel close? Why shouldn't I feel close to the many women that are members of this group when you have so many that are active beyond the confines of this group? Like this gal on my right, secretary of our Northeastern Ohio General Service area. Friends, this is a day I feel should be one of rededication, reevaluation, and ask ourselves, how come this just didn't happen? We at Independence celebrated our 11th anniversary last Thursday. The meeting itself just didn't happen. It took the cooperation of all the members of AA, to, of our Independence group, to arrange, to go through the mechanics of arranging these things. To arrange for what you see here tonight. People who place proper value on their membership. Not just leaving two or three do it all. The group as a whole participating. That's what makes groups function. And there's no greater purpose a group has than to carry the message. Carry the message to those who still suffer and to those who have surrendered Surrender to the idea that their system of thinking and living isn't so good. We learn by association, and our association is in our group. Oh, these, these things are, I think they're very necessary, these anniversary dates. So that not only the people in the group, but those who wish them well, like you folks who are visitors here tonight, you like to know that these things just don't happen. And yet, there are thousands of alcoholics in this town tonight that will never set foot in an AA meeting. How many meetings have you gone to that you've seen the sign? By the grace of God. Or you heard the speaker say, by the grace of God. By the grace of God, people come into AA. And those that don't come, you figure that. Grace was extended, they refused, or they never heard the call. Maybe the call wasn't extended. But to think that you and I had this opportunity. And there's nothing more important in our lives than we stay sober. There's no greater responsibility, can I assume, and the membership that goes along with membership and the responsibility that goes along with membership in AA. I say that without reservation. I say that in front of my preacher. In fact, I told him that plenty of times. They don't want me if I'm a drunk. They don't even want you in heaven if you're a drunk. If you're a Christian, you look in the Bible, it'll tell you so. No drunks allowed. That's no joke. How many times did you ever think about when you're drunk, you wake up and you say, oh my God, I'm glad I didn't die drunk. <laughs> That's the only good thought ever run through my mind the morning after the night before. And I mean it. I don't have to worry like that anymore. I don't have that worry. I got other worries. I got some freshmen since I'm in here. But I don't have to worry about dying drunk. And you know another thing? I found out I can stay sober as long as I want to stay sober. And you can stay sober as long as you want to stay sober. As long as you follow this program, the best of your individual ability, one day at a time. You say you shouldn't say that. You'll have to be drunk tomorrow. I will not be drunk tomorrow if I don't want to be drunk tomorrow. You don't have to be drunk either. Anybody that prays around says, I don't know how long this is going to last. You know how long it's going to last? As long as we're worthy of the grace of God. As long as we live the kind of a life according to his set of standards, he'll sustain us. None of us can live a perfect life. But God gives an awful lot of credit for trying. He must because I fall down miserably every day in many, many avenues. But I try. I want to stay so. 
I know I can't assume any other responsibility. I can't be a good Christian. I can't be a good American. I can't be a good husband. I can't be a good neighbor. I can't be good at anything unless I'm sober. And I don't believe that I can stay sober unless I have some active appreciation for this priceless privilege. And that active appreciation can't come any better place than an alcoholic synonym. The 12th step. To carry on. To practice these principles in all of our affairs. When a person comes to Alcoholics Anonymous, unless uh, he was threatened, you got to serve divorce papers if you get drunk once more, or the boss says, you're fired if you get drunk once more. Well, that's good enough for anybody to come in. But we come in here, usually it's because we're at the bottom. We found our own private little gutter, and it stinks. There's heartaches and tears, strife and turmoil. You doubt your sanity. Remember how you used to get up in the morning, try to piece together what you didn't say the night before? Before it's halfway completed, you say, oh my God, I must be going nuts. You ever say that to yourself? What do you think they got the second step in the program for? <laughs> Came to believe that a part within ourselves could start restore us to sanity. If it means restore to sanity, it must have been nuts. If you weren't nuts, you would have to be restored. So what happens? You're at the bottom of the barrel. It's awful. You reach up and you say, oh, God, please get me out of this. It's awful. He reaches down, grabs you by the arm, starts taking you out. Take a little bit of that dirt along, you know what happens? He lets go. You and the whole business are back in the store. Even if you're sober 20 years, this group can fold. If for no other reason than complacency. We had some old groups fold in Cleveland the last couple of years. I'm not going to mention them. You know. Why do they fold? Complacency. Don't go back. They don't need God. They are going to run the show. Nobody runs the show. Bang, they're out of business. Now, what is this dirt I'm talking about? What's this dirt I'm talking about? You go back with your left hand. God's got a hold of us. He's keeping us out of the gutter, holding up, keeping us out. We're wonderful. But, you know, some people, they used to remember. Naughty but nice. It's naughty but nice. You ever hear that? Nothing naughty nice. You know that. So we go for some of that dirt. Do I have to spell out what that dirt is? I don't think so. I don't have to spell it out because you and I became alcoholics. We found out that we could dull our conscience with alcohol. We had cop trouble, wife trouble, husband trouble, money trouble. That's just the aftermath. The trouble was there long before we got that booze. That wrong system of thinking and living and then pour booze on top. You really got a mess. That's an alcoholic. He found out that he could dull his conscience with alcohol. So he comes to AA, he don't want to drink anymore. They take the booze away from him. Well, how's he going to keep from drinking? Before we found AA, we had to drink, didn't we? No, nobody else could understand that, but we had to drink. I paid the bar bill before I paid the landlord. Why did we have to drink? You can't tell that to other people. They say, oh, you're nuts. You alcoholics, you're screwballs. Nobody has to drink. Well, a practicing alcoholic has to drink. That's the only temporary relief he or she can get. Why do you have to drink to go to sleep at night? You can't live with yourself. You're rolling thoughts. The doggone conscience is bothering you. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale calls conscience the needle that pricks your soul that tells you when you're going wrong. Now he says, it pricks you, jags you, break it off, stick it in. Burn it, woo, <laughs> Terrible. So you come to age because you don't want to drink anymore. You don't want to drink anymore and you don't need to drink anymore. What do you got to do? You follow this program. What's this program? The same thing your mother and father gave you before you ever went to high school. Grammar school. And first thing you know, insidiously, this thing sneaks up on you. 
In the beginning, you might feel like I did. She was 31 years old and I can't drink anymore. My mother's 60. She could take a cold bottle of beer on a hot summer after and I couldn't even take a thimble full. <laughs> My father's cousin, Ed, 84 years old. He could drink beer, play pinochle all night long. Never smashed up a car. Why couldn't I be like that? 31 years old, I had to quit drinking. And there was a few in AA at that time that said I was too young. They said they spilled more in their vests than I ever drank. And in their own way, they, they figured they were right. But I stuck around anyhow. And for a while, I, oh, I knew I couldn't drink with safety, but uh, it was pretty much of a sacrifice, you know, to give up 31 years old. And I uh, felt a little bit sorry for myself. Oh, I knew I couldn't drink, but isn't it a shame that I had to quit? It's awful. But I kept coming around, and after a few years, it finally dawned on me. I don't have to drink. And that's a wonderful thing. That doesn't mean that you can be cocky and you can be complacent and you can be so confident that you don't have to go to meetings anymore. No. I believe that's about the time when you really start to place proper value on this thing. When you come to the full realization that you don't have to drink. Boy, that's wonderful. That's when them spoons, instead of smell, they begin to stink. That's when you don't find any reason to go to saloons anymore. You know, I used to go in the, all the first couple paydays. I'd, I'd go over to the saloon on Denison Avenue. And I was working at aluminum company then. And I was buying the boys drinks and I was taking Coca-Cola. And then this Romanian, he couldn't even laugh in English. He, <laughs> He says, what are you doing here? I pay thousand dollars for a ticket on wall not to sell you pop. He didn't want my business. I'm only buying pop. He didn't, he didn't know I was buying drinks or anything. And you know, I, that was a good question. What am I doing in there? What was I doing in there? Getting nickel drinks for, you see, you could buy a nickel drink in it. You could even buy a nickel beer then. I'm buying these drinks. I'm getting, well, what was I doing? It? You know what I was doing in there? I was trying to prove to a few clowns that I didn't have to drink whiskey. And they didn't care. You know, the other day I heard a fellow say, for us to go into a saloon is like a man to go into a house of ill repute just to talk to the girls. <laughs> That's the truth. Say, well, I got good roast beef sandwiches in there. Uh, what am I talking like this for? <laughs> we were at a, a at an anniversary party and I'm telling them kind of story. Well, folks, AA can mean just as much to you, to me, as we want it to. When Warren Chisholm says there isn't a problem that we could ever have, that we can't find the solution in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm positive he's right. These things just don't happen. You and I didn't become alcoholics in most cases. We didn't become alcoholics the first drink, the first year. Well, there's some, I, I can truly believe them when they say they, they were alcoholics from the first draft that they had when they fell out of the cradle. I went to a meeting one night and a guy took me from the time he was four till he was 60. An hour and ten minutes of nothing but misery. And then he said, and then my troubles began. <laughs> well, my troubles didn't begin when I started to drink whiskey. I had more fun on them barrel of monkeys with a mile of clothesline. There's a few people in this room, and Mike over here can verify that. But the ratio changed. The one was 99.5% fun and a half percent headaches. You know, a cold shower and a clean shirt in the morning. All set. Young, snapback. But it didn't stay that way. It got to where it was 50% fun and 50% headaches. 
It wasn't so bad. It was still even Stephen, but a troublation was coming along. And then I decided I'd get back to where I had these good old days of fun drinking. And I tried. And you tried. I didn't get back, and you didn't get back. The ratio keeps changing. It got to 75% headaches, 25% relief. No fun, just relief. To go into that never, never land. Yes, we were going to quit. Someday. The first of the month, after the holidays, after the vacation, mañana, mañana, mañana. And so then it came to where we had to drink. It was the only temporary relief that we could have. The only way we could live with ourselves. The only way we could go to sleep at night. It was horrible. Getting up five, six mornings out of the week, doubting your sanity. The phone would ring. Who answered? I'm not here. Ooh, afraid to go to the doorbell. Afraid to go to the mailbox. Last holiday that I drank, the last Christmas holiday, card from my mother and father, my sister, my brother, and one friend. Isn't that awful? My dog gets more cards than that now. <laughs> And yet, I wanted people to think I was the right guy. I believe we all wanted people to think we were all right. We wanted their attention. We wanted their respect. We wanted their love. And we tried to get it our way. Buy them drinks. Tell them lies. The only people that were interested in us were the people that we tried to entertain by buying drinks, by trying to show them that we're good time Charlies, but it was always at the expense of those that we, that loved us the most. Insidiously, these things take place. They don't happen overnight. And there isn't a man on Skid Row that didn't believe all through his life. It can't happen to me. But it did. And I understand that 10% of the people on Skid Row, any Skid Row, are college graduates. So it isn't because of a lack of intelligence, training, or education. No. It's because alcoholics are a peculiar people. When they drink, they're not normal. And when they're an alcoholic, they must drink. They've got to drink. To live. To live with themselves. But thank God, Alcoholics Anonymous came along in 1935. And by the time most of us came into the program, it was all true at the trial by air stage. Most of us that are here tonight came in after the traditions were written and found to be necessary and true. And so, when we think of the days before AA, when the best that medical science and religion could boast of was a 2% recovery, and we ask ourselves, what happened to the other 98? And there's only one answer. They went to a drunkard's grave. Yes, and you can go to a drunkard's grave, with a million dollars in each pocket. And when we think of those pioneer members of AA, how, even though they, they didn't think this thing would work, they kept on their perseverance. And they had their differences. But yet they knew they had to stick together. They had to hang together. Or John Farley Corner kill them! And so, when we think of all of these people that went to a drunkard's grave, part AA, and to think that now this is available for you and I, shouldn't praises go heavenward for thanksgiving every day of our lives that God left us with enough buttons that we could comprehend this simple program. 
let's never get anybody to get us balled up when the statement taken out of context by Dr. Bob at his last talk in Cleveland when he did mention, keep it simple and away from Freudianism. Keep the program itself simple. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous is none other than 12 steps. The individual recovery program is 12 suggested steps of AA. That's where the individual gets sober. That's our first legacy. And then the second, because we needed unity and we found it was necessary, and it had to be spelled out for us, the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous came into play. The program, remember, is the 12 steps, the 12 suggested steps. That's our recovery program, and that's our first legacy. The second legacy is our unity, where we found it's necessary that we commune and meet with each other, not only as individuals, but as groups. And we do this job of 12-step work at the group level. And then, because so many demands were made, for information, for literature, not only by members of AA, but those who wanted to know something about our program, non-alcoholics, like men of science and men of industry. Alcoholism is a serious problem in personnel departments. So all of these things, by 1955, after we had had several general service meetings in New York, in 1955 in St. Louis at our 20th anniversary, the third legacy came into being. Service. Where there was no doubt that these services had to be rendered. And it had to be done in some orderly fashion. So, my dear friends, we who are here tonight to help celebrate the 20th anniversary of this group, Let's also consider that it was a group like this that made a terrific contribution to A as a whole, if for no other reason than to prove that this works at the group level. Twenty years now. And I might say, too, that this group is very active in general service. And it supports general service. There I am talking about money again. <laughs> but I'm not afraid to talk about money. No, oh, there's a lot more to this AA than just praying, going to a meeting, eating three sandwiches, drinking four cups of coffee, and put a dime in the box. There's a lot more to it. I'm sure that more groups, as time goes on, will follow in the paths of this group by thinking beyond the confines of this immediate community. They're active at intergroup level, our area level, and world service. I'm glad to be in a group with such a fine record. I can't say that wherever I go. They're all good groups, mind you. But many, many, they haven't yet realized that the responsibility involved in membership in Alcoholics Anonymous as far as the individual is concerned as well as the group. That responsibility goes beyond the confines of the immediate community. More groups are seeing that. And the more that see that, the faster and the better this story can be told. And more souls recover. I'm not trying to enter into religion when I mention souls. But I can't think of a better description that defines alcoholism than gangrene of the soul. Isn't that awful? Gangrene of the soul. I said before, they don't allow drunks up in heaven. That's the truth. And as far as our sobriety is concerned, it doesn't just mean our sobriety because we no longer drink alcohol. Like John Watt in a meeting yesterday morning in Akron, he mentioned to be sober means to be sober in all things. And I believe that. I never heard that interpretation before. 
not to be extremists. That's a big job in itself, just to get yourself down half the time. Or pull yourself up to be level, to be sober in all of our affairs. If we don't, the chances are we'll get involved. Get involved? What's the next step? Frustration. And I don't care if I'm sober 25 years. If I should stay frustrated long enough, you know what's going to happen? This thing starts working. Take a couple shots, Ben, off. You don't have to put up with it. That'll give you a relief. That'll give you a relief. Take a couple shots. Take a couple shots. You see how you go for it. We can't afford to get involved because the next step is frustration and we're alcoholics and we know we'll never forget as long as we stay sober. We'll never forget that we can get temporary relief from alcohol. And that usually comes when we're frustrated. Most people don't get drunk in AA because of a catastrophe. No. It's a lot of little things that cause them to be involved. Frustration sets in. They can't live with themselves. Frustration again, in my case, I'm sure it'd be my conscience. My conscience would become active to the point where I couldn't live with myself. Conscience? Why do you have a conscience? People talk about a conscience. Norman Vincent Peale, like I told you, it says it's the needle. It pricks your soul. It tells me you're going along. Why do you have a conscience? I understand as far as I'm concerned there are a lot of things that I can do, I can say, and many more things that I can think that no one will ever catch me. Do or say. They'll never find out my intentions or my motives. But you know, I believe this power greater than myself. He knows what goes on in my mind. He is not only omnipresent, omnipotent, but he is omniscient. He knows my intentions. He knows my motives. And just as soon as those thoughts are first created up in my mind, thoughts, lusts, desires, whatever you want to call it, I'm caught. And you check me. Anytime you have those thoughts and you develop them and you get involved and the next step is frustration, anything can happen. Well, now, isn't that a good time to pray? When we know that these thoughts, when they're first created in our mind, if we only say, oh God, please help me change my mind. I don't want to go through with this. Create a right spirit within me. If we want to stay sober bad enough, we're going to be alert. We're going to be diligent and vigilant in the application of these principles. And yet, regardless of what our creed, our beliefs, our religion might be, this program conflicts with no one's spiritual understanding. Isn't that miraculous in itself? So, when I say, or I ask the question, isn't it wonderful to be sober? You know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? I say that so many times to myself because if it wouldn't have been for me being an alcoholic, I'd have never been eligible for membership in AA. I'd have went to a drunkard's grave by now. Why shouldn't I be happy? Why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't we be grateful to an ever-loving God that a group like this is possible? <coughs> if for no other reason they have an anniversary once a year, we can congregate here and help them celebrate, help them share their joy. Let's rededicate ourselves. When we leave here tonight, let's open up the big book more often. If we haven't got AA of age, comes of age, don't wait until you have to win one. Buy one! <laughs> I'm not kidding. Buy one. If we haven't got the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, $2.75, buy one.
This is the greatest responsibility we ever took on in our life. If you go on a new job, you're going to want to learn all about it, just as fast as you can. And everything in our lives depends upon our sobriety. Oh, there's so many things we can do if we're self-starters. Oh, the first couple of weeks, let the sponsor pick us up and get us around. Wonderful. But don't let's depend on him for a toll of forever. Let's go to the meetings tonight that we don't want to go. Let's make an effort, extra effort to go to the meeting tonight when the snow is that high. Or when it's hotter than the hinges of Hades outside. No matter what the TV program is. No matter how lousy things went that day, that's the night we should go to meet. Like Warren said the other night, never can you ever go to an AA meeting feeling lousy for what you don't come home feeling good. I've got to quit. I know you people are getting hungry. Some of you have sat a long time. But please, let's remember. Thousands of people, and millions of people, will never get the break that you and I have got. That break we got when we had the opportunity to set our foot in the first AA meeting we ever attended. And it's up to us from now on, if we don't do anything else, then to show our God our appreciation for his grace. And there's nothing we can do for him except try to carry this message the best of our ability to those who are in AA and to those who still suffer. By our example, we will attract others. By our example, we will show our God our appreciation. We don't have to worry anymore about what people think. No, that's not a concern of ours anymore. Of course, we're not going to go out and do things that happen to throw rocks at us. But we're not concerned too much about what people think. Let's be a little bit more concerned about how we stack up with God as we understand. And then we can continue, like this group, Enjoy 20 anniversaries, 25, 30, 35, just as long as we want to stay sober. God won't let us stop. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.